We received a, a number of questions here. Um, one is, uh, what are the most promising biomarkers currently for diagnosis and disease progression? That's a difficult one. I could maybe direct that to, to Daniel. You, you want to answer this one? So the biomarkers right now that are uh, potentially being used for MSA, one is uh, brain imaging. So if you look at um, MRIs of brains and certain patterns of the way the brains change and certain collections of things like iron or changes in um, white matter integrity where that where that's located that has potential to be a good biomarker not only for is it MSA but also how is the disease progressing and how uh, severe is the disease another one that's being used is um, different biofluid markers and these have been really um, tried in other neurodegenerative diseases, but things like, there's these things called neurofilament light chain, NFL, is one uh, potential uh, biomarker of disease. Uh, and then there are other uh, ways to potentially look at alpha-synuclein, which have been used in Parkinson's disease recently to, to diagnose uh, and potentially follow the severity of disease. And I think the third one that I would say hasn't um, come to fruition, but really I think needs to be explored is the clinical uh, progression. How do we quantify how much disease a person has and how it's progressing? And I think that's really one of the goals that the biomarker and, and clinical follow-up of patients uh, program has is can we actually figure out how to determine how a patient is feeling, how severe they are, and how those uh, feelings and symptoms change over time because if you had a therapy that could show uh, was working, you really want to show that it affects patient lives rather than just, you know, a, a clinician's exam. And I think that's really the hope that in terms of clinical biomarkers, we can get a lot of um, momentum, especially with these kind of collaborative clinical assessments that were referred to. Is that enough? Yes. There, I think there are very many questions. I'm not sure whether we can get through all of them. There is a there is a question on um, on the uh, MSA uh, mouse models that we we have been using to screen new drugs that might help in MSA. And the question is how that really works in a, in a mouse model. So just to explain how, how we do that in a nutshell, um, we are basically overexpressing the human synuclein um, in the glial cells in, in, these, in these mice. So basically, when we look at these um, mouse brains, what we see is exactly the same types of synuclein inclusions in glia that we see in the human MSA brain. And so what we do then is that we just follow up these mice that have these synuclein buildups in the brain. And interestingly, as these mice um, get older, they develop spontaneously, if you like, they develop the Parkinson phenotype of MSA. They don't develop the cerebellar phenotype, they develop the, the Parkinson phenotype. So to us, this indicates that the synuclein inclusions in MSA, if they are really the primary event that happens in these brains, they are able to trigger the Parkinson-like pathology. And we also have evidence that they attack the autonomic nerves in these MSA mouse brains. So I think that's why these models have been very valuable to us. The second question is about dementia and MSA. I think I can probably reassure you by saying that dementia is exceedingly rare in MSA. Some patients might have problem, mild problems with 
uh, what we call frontal lobe function, which means that you sort of shift from one exercise to the other, from one task to the other. There may be some delays with that, but th this is really nowhere near the type of dementia that we see in, in Parkinson dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies. So why dementia is so uncommon in MSA is unclear. Uh, but certainly this is not a kind of um, uh, major issue, I would say. Um, then there's a the question whether it's possible at some stage to reverse all this toxic synuclein buildup in nerve cells in MSA patients. Obviously this has always been touched upon in the presentations today. It's very impor important to identify MSA as early as possible, and there's evidence that you can even diagnose MSA by in the pre-motor phase by autonomic issues or REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, and interestingly, MSA patients in these very, very early stages they have a preserved sense of smell. Olfaction, which is destroyed in Parkinson's disease, is preserved in MSA. So by kind of this pattern recognition, you may be able to diagnose MSA very, very early on. And this is part of uh, also of the ongoing natural history study that Dr. Kaufman presented. The last one, before I hand over to the colleagues, is about supplements and, and vitamins and herbs as part of the treatment. Uh, you know, there's really no evidence to support that, but in my clinical practice, what I recommend to patients with MSA, particularly when they are kind of early in the disease, I rec recommend complex vitamin B types of uh, supplements. Um, uh, you know, there's one that we use in Austria uh, mainly, and um, I recommend a kind of pulse of that, you know, like for two months and then stop for two months, start again for two months. And I also recommend to combine that with coenzyme Q10 supplements uh, because there's this evidence from the Japanese literature that this might work in the cerebella presentations of MSA. So with that, I hand over to the others. So the first question I have directed for me is what criteria are required to be the high risk subset in the natural history study? So if you recall, we are following um, a number of patients that we believe are high risk of developing MSA in the future. We are including patients that have uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, which is dream reenactment, acting out dreams. So many times these patients may shout, scream, get out of bed or, or react to vivid, vivid dreams when they should be still. And we know that, uh, that of that, and some patients will develop MSA and that may be the first sign that they have. We are also following patients that have neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, which is a fall in blood pressure on standing and low blood pressure in the upright position. That that's caused by a problem with the nervous system. And what we see in our cohort is that if we take those patients, around 8% will develop multiple system atrophy within two to three years. And then if you take what, what we were able to do, which goes back to finding MSA sooner, is see, like Gregor Wenning said, is that preserved sense of smell a high incidence of bladder abnormalities or a need for treatment of bladder and, and GI abnormalities, um, and as well as some autonomic biomarkers like a slightly faster heart rate or um, signs that the sympathetic nerves going to the blood vessels are intact may also be pointers that this might be early MSA, along with the patients having preserved sense of smell and no real cognitive abnormalities in the early stage. So that, that group of cohort of patients we are closely following to look at their trajectory to see how they evolve. The other question we have is what's the role of head injuries in multiple system atrophy patients and in research and are you finding a link? We, we've spoken a lot about what could be the potential factors that predispose multiple system atrophy. We've heard about genetics and so far we, we have 
genetic studies which may be underpowered, but since we don't see any direct inheritory and inher inherited traits, we, we are looking also in other factors with the possibility that genetics, may, our answer may lie in other areas. So with, in terms of head inju injuries, when you come into the natural history study with MSA, we will ask the clinician to collect a strong history from you, looking at family incidents of dementia, things like head injuries, head injuries, smoking, all the types of history that you would normally get to see within the cohort if we can pull out some of the environmental factors that might be contributing. So I'm going to pass the microphone now to Dr. Clausen. I feel like I've talked too much already. Okay, we'll go through quick ones. Do clinical trials have fees? No. If someone charges you to be in a clinical trial, call the police. <laughs> Are clinical trials vetted on clinicaltrials.gov? Um, there's, I think they're usually, it's kind of a, there's no one that tells you whether it's a good trial to be in or a bad trial to be in. Um, you can sometimes look at the funding sources to get a sense of, you know, who's advocating for it. For instance, if it's funded by the National Institute of Health, it means that it's been peer reviewed and that it's gone through a, quite a number of different levels of um, review. Uh, so they're not exactly, you know, vetted for how good or bad they are, but they're just there. And you can also look at some of the outcome measures to kind of get a sense for how things are. Da Daniel, can yeah. I just jump in there? Yeah. Someone had mentioned, um, uh, Gregor had mentioned stem cell trials before, and at least until recently, even some of these privately kind of more dubious, doubtful stem cell trials were actually listed yep. on sure. clinicaltrials.gov. Yep. So, so be careful, it's not, not so well curated. Uh, I'll do, I'm kind of more interested to hear what Dennis has to say, but I'll do a couple more. Um, can you combine being in an MSA symptom reduction trial and a disease modifying trial at the same time? Great question. When I talked about inclusion and exclusion criteria, oftentimes exclusion criteria include current enrollment in a clinical trial. And so I think most of the time, like I would say 99% of the time, you can't be in two trials at once, with the exclusion being if you're in an observational study. Oftentimes you can be in a trial and you can still stay in the observational study. Um, but the, the protocol should have very clear um, guidelines as to whether or not you can be in another trial. Generally speaking, if you're getting a therapeutic intervention, you wouldn't want to be in another one. Um, and I'll, you want to do one more? All right. I know you want to say stuff. All right, you're gonna have the answer for us here. Do stage three trials benefit patients or are they more for the benefit of science? Absolutely, they benefit patients. This is the question for stage three. If I see you in my clinic and I diagnose you with MSA and I give you this therapy, does it make a difference? That's what stage three trials do. They replicate real world enrollment and therapeutic trials to see if it works or not. And I think we, we, would, we generally guide our practice based on the, the, the trials in terms of how they're run, who's in them, and the outcome measures. So I think they're very important for patients. Um, last one, MSA diagnosis is a risk for clinical failure. Definitely. Uh, I assume that's for clinical trial failure, especially if drug target is specific for MSA. Any ideas to reduce this risk? I think one of the um, goals of like natural history study and uh, in particular is to try and understand what are the clinical predictors of MSA. There are certain diseases that we're quite good at diagnosing based on certain clinical phenomena. I think with MSA, sometimes we have a little bit harder time, but things like Imaging markers, things like clinical uh, phenomena, like say sense of smell or orthostatic hypotension, how much a person has, they're generally useful in terms of helping us uh, to kind of more, more specifically diagnose MSA. So I think, um, yes, that's true, but I think we're doing much better at knowing which clinical features help us really narrow down on MSA versus something else. Okay, so. There's a question about um, MSAC and MSAP. Can you can a, a single individual have both um, um, diagnoses? And I, I guess I want to just frame this question in the terms of what's a clinical diagnosis and what's a pathologic diagnosis. So the clinical diagnosis is MSAC. You have a clinical syndrome with cerebellar predominant clinical features. MSAP is MSA with predominant Parkinsonian, atypical Parkinsonian. 
when we look at it the, at pathology, we talk about olivopontocerebellar atrophy or striatonigral degeneration. And they usually they correlate pretty well. So striatonigral is usually a, an MSAP clinical presentation. And olivopontocerebellar atrophy is usually an MSAC clinical presentation. But in fact, the pathology in an MSAC patient, there's pathology in the striatonigral system. In an MSAP system, they always have pathology in the cerebellum, the pons, and the olive. It's the thing that determines which clinical presentation the patient has is where the, the neuronal damage is the worst. So MSA patients have pathology in both systems. Everybody has in both. They have olivopontocerebellar and stratonigral. But the degree of neuronal loss may be greater in one or the other. And the neuronal loss determines um, the clinical syndrome. So I don't, it's probably still not clear. <laughs> but it's, it's basically, think about the pathology being everywhere in terms of, especially the glial pathology, but where the neuronal loss varies. And I'll have to say, in some patients, especially at the end stage of the disease, it's not always easy um, to make a distinction in terms of OPCA and stratonigral degeneration because the patient has severe pathology in all systems. And we think of that as, as it's, it's not a very good term, but it's sometimes referred to as end stage disease when basically all the systems are affected. And then there was a, one qu a question about uh, can, you, can a person uh, make a, do a brain do donation if they have another uh, clinical syndrome or pathologic a clinical syndrome, I guess, because they don't have pathology. So, for example, if you had MSA, but you also had clinical features of, say, ALS. And absolutely, those are the um, patients that are, can be very informative um, if, in fact, they have two separate neurodegenerative diseases. And in, um, MSA patients, for some reason, tend to be relatively pure in terms of Alzheimer pathology. I showed in the table, I didn't emphasize it, but if you look at a, a Parkinson patient, a Lewy body dementia patient, they very frequently have comorbid Alzheimer pathology. MSA patients almost never have comorbid Alzheimer pathology. So if you in fact did have an MSA patient that had also Alzheimer's or ALS, that would be a very in, in, informative type of patient to study. Because um, it might suggest some link between the different neurodegenerative disease processes. Okay, so um, I have a question, and one one question here is actually in two parts. So actually, um, Dr. Dixon may be a good person to weigh in on one of these. Um, someone was, uh, someone has been interested in iron accumulation that was mentioned because a couple of the therapies, potential therapies, are involved in reducing iron accumulation. And so the first part of this question is, is you know, could you use phlebotomy, which is, you know, just removing blood to, um, to, to treat these diseases. I mean, it's an interesting thought. Um, it is used for certain diseases like hemochromatosis. It's been proposed for neurodegenerative diseases, but because of the compliance with phlebotomy, the, the, the need to take blood, you know, chronically, it's, it's uh, people have generally preferred um, using drugs to reduce iron, so so-called iron chelators. Um, and the iron chelators that have been typically used for diseases like hemochromatosis do not cross the blood-brain barrier, so they wouldn't be effective for a disease like MSA, but that's why companies uh, like Prana, for example, that, that Professor Venning mentioned are, are designing um, brain-specific um, agents that can reduce iron. But the second part of this question where it would be great to have um, Dr. Dixon's input also is whether um, we should screen for hereditary hemochromatosis um, in patients with neurodegenerative diseases. Um, it traditionally, I think, has been thought that, that hemochromatosis does not really cause um, you know, a degenerative brain disease, although I believe some of that data is a little, uh, a little controversial, and there, there have been studies suggesting that there are changes, um, you know, certainly at the cellular level, in patients with hemochromatosis, but I don't know if you want to comment any more on that. If, um, so if the, the, the iron that accumulates in MSA doesn't seem to be a, um, a primary disease process. It seems to be late. Um, 
And it could be as neurons die or the reactive changes in the, the support cells, the glial cells, that um, there's accumulation of iron. Um, in terms of the hemochromatosis, there's almost no neurodegenerative pathology seen in hemochromatosis. And if there is iron deposition, it's an exaggeration of the iron that accumulates usually around blood vessels in certain parts of the brain that are different, different brain regions from those that are affected in MSA. Um, so it's the basal ganglia, but it's in the globus pallidus, whereas in MSA, the pathology is in the putamen and the caudate. So it's, it, it's anatomically, it's like real estate. It's, these are different plots of land. So they're different disease processes. So screening for hemochromatosis would not be really very um, useful at all. Thanks so much. And, um, and the last question was, can we manufacture dopamine producing neurons from skin cells? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, and so, um, so, so you can turn skin cells into these induced pluripotent stem cells, these embryonic stem cell like cells that I mentioned. And there are good protocols to efficiently make um, midbrain type dopamine secreting neurons from these cells. And so there are a number of groups and companies um, that are uh, testing this for Parkinson's disease. Um, now, Parkinson's disease um, may be uh, a, a potential target for such a therapy because um, the loss of those cells is really profound and, um, and, and it's a central part of the, the, the symptomatology of the disease, the loss of those neurons. Um, even in Parkinson's disease though, many different systems of the brain and nervous system are affected, so whether just replacing one type of cell is is a good therapy um, is 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 you know there's 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 pros and cons for thinking about that uh, and especially in a disease like multiple system atrophy where as you've heard today from the pathology there are many different systems in the brain and outside the brain that are affected the usefulness of just transplanting one type of cell uh, back into the brain is in would be questionable um, but the simple answer is that yes, you can make these cells, and yes, they could theoretically be used for transplantation, and these are being tested right now. So I, I have a few more questions regarding therapy also. So somebody asks about high-intensity exercise uh, for progression of MSA. I, I usually tell my patients it should not be high-intensity. They should not get exhausted with these exercises it should be like moderately exercising moderately and um, feeling good with the exercise um, so I, I mentioned to you the study that we've done with um, uh, uh, physiotherapy focused on gait disorder in MSA where we saw like 20 percent improvements with the sensor-based technology see sensors hooked onto the shoe and so we have some parameters there that tell us something is going on and the patients felt well with that. So I would say no to high intensity exercise but moderate exercise would be good. And then the, another question which is not so easy to address, which is the number one drug to uh, change the disease course in MSA? I tried to highlight uh, all the different kind of uh, drugs in the pipeline right now. To me personally, I think um, there are three or four that maybe are particularly interesting. One is trying to influence uh, neuroinflammation, and this is the ongoing MSTAR trial by Biohave, and that is interesting, uh, an interesting uh, concept. Then also, interventions based on um, synuclein, um, uh, stopping to uh, synuclein from, from aggregating. So uh, I mentioned immunization, I mentioned synuclein antibodies, and there's also, which I didn't mention, there's also an activity now ongoing using antisense oligonucleotides trying to reduce the synuclein levels in MSA patients, so that's interesting. And maybe there is also the approach of small molecules, and I mentioned the ANLI 138B, that's been so successful to reduce um, protein aggregation, including synuclein in various models. 
There is one uh, question about placebo effect in clinical trials. We all know from Parkinson's disease this can be substantial up to 40% in some of the Parkinson's disease trials. Um, there's nothing known about this in MSA. My guess is that uh, in the absence of symptomatically effective interventions, maybe the placebo effect um, would be substantially lower. Um, there is one question about MIBG scintigraphy in MSA. Is that useful? Um, just to explain to you, this is a a uh, diagnostic test that uh, measures the integrity of sympathetic fibers in the heart muscle. And interestingly, in Parkinson's disease, there is a complete denervation of the heart muscle using this technique, MIBG scintigraphy. And in, in MSA, in most MSA patients, not all of them, but in most, there is a preserved cardiac innervation. So, Basically, it can provide useful information, but there are MSA patients who have uh, pathology in the heart muscle as well, so sometimes it can be difficult. The last one uh, is about, again, stem cells. We've talked about that uh, already. I think uh, right now I'm only aware of that one academic protocol from the Mayo Clinic where they are they have submitted that to NIH where they would like to establish whether lumbar uh, or whether mesenchymal stem cells delivered by lumbar puncture could modify the disease in, in MSA. So, but they haven't um, got approval for that. So that would be very interesting to follow. So the question I have is about registries and it's how is the NYU study, you talked about different from CORDS, and CORD is the coordination of rare diseases at Stanford. There are many um, different registries, like because there are many different rare diseases, right? So there are multiple different di rare diseases, which when you put all the rare diseases together, it affects a substantial number of people. Unlike interventional trials, it's when you're trying something to see if it makes you better, you can participate in different registries in which you're just providing your information. So the, our specific registry for MSA is focused on MSA. So we're asking questions specific for MSA that, that may or may not apply for, um, for other rare diseases, but we are specifically looking at what may apply to MSA. So the short answer to this is yes, you can join other registries, but consider also giving your information to registries that are specific about your disease, because the other factor of that is that if you provide your information within a contact registry, if there is a treatment or if there is a local support group that is applicable to you, you can then get the information because it will come back to you. So there may be there may be advantages of participating in a registry that's for all rare diseases, of course, to know the impact collectively of rare diseases, but there are also distinct advantages on participating in one that's specific for your disease. So this question's from uh, the internet. Uh, basically, the question is discussing clinical uh, team approach and this individual is running into a challenge that the team approach is being restricted through Medicare rules on um, in-home care outpatient. So I think um, for all of us that treat MSA, I think all of us enjoy the interdisciplinary team approach much better than just um, one person running the show because everyone has different expertise. Um, and Medicare shouldn't stop that team approach. Um, sometimes it's, it's true that rare diseases, the, the clinician like the physical therapist or um, occupational therapist may not know much about MSA, but part of what the team approach does is that everyone kind of educates each, each other. And uh, so with our therapists, sometimes we do um, crash courses on MSA and we'll have meetings with them and talk about kind of the issues we're struggling with and we'll look at some of the literature that has been published on, you know, ways to tackle um, uh, MSA therapeutically. So I wouldn't let Medicare hold you back from doing a team approach. Instead, I would look at it more as really encouraging the clinicians that you see to build those teams. Um, when you 
demand that you want an interdisciplinary uh, approach, people generally respond, and I think um, I think that's really one way to do it is just kind of expect it. All right. Well, thank you very much. We hit the witching hour. Okay. Good job, everybody. Congratulations. <laughs>